it's a very tight margin business and I suppose a lot of costs are attributable to that winter period, whether it's your weanings going in and trying to maintain a drive over the next few months before they go back out or whether you're finishing cattle. But really focus on the basics, having a healthy animal, good quality forage or understanding what level of performance is achievable from the forage and feeding to meet the targets above that when it's required. So looking at high quality ingredients for going out and paying for concentrate ingredients that you're buying in good quality ration into the yard and know what you're working with in terms of the overall forage quality. There's a lot of work in terms of feeding out and labour with cattle in sheds so it's important that you're getting as much value out of that for the work that's involved and the costs involved over the next few months. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, Chagas nutritionist Ashling Claffey discusses winter nutrition and diets. Ashling, you're very welcome. Firstly, congratulations on your new role as Chagas nutritionist. You're very welcome to Chagas. Can you give a background to your career to date? I'm a dairy farmer in the Midlands and I suppose after completing my ag science degree in UCD, I spent three years in Moorpark and I completed my PhD down there. So my research focused on grassland production systems and early lactation nutrition in dairy cows. And then after that, I spent the last five years working in the industry. So I worked with a feed mill in the Midlands and I provided technical support to their sales team for the last few years before joining Chagas this summer. That's great, Ashley. We're delighted to have you joining the Chagas team. We're coming back again to housing and year on year, there are a number of different factors that farmers need to consider to maximise performance on farms. And look, sure, beef systems, like all ruminant production systems, are simple, really. It comes down to trying to maximise intake and growth. Um, everything we can get into that animal over and above their maintenance requirements is contributing to growth and performance. So it's really important that we minimise stress, any health issues and digestive upsets, so that we're getting the most out of our feed particularly over the winter months because it's con- contributing significantly to the overall cost. So we want to get the most out of the animals and maintain thrive um, as cheaply and efficiently as possible. Um, and for finishing animals earlier, we can get them out as well, the better, because there's a significant cost incurred during that period. So maximising thrive and trying to reduce the days we're in that period of finishing and high cost production. So I suppose like if we look at it, there's a combination of factors really that'll affect that um, over and above their genetic potential. So we need to control management factors um, and dietary factors. And I suppose looking at herd health as well. Um, so ideally we'll have implemented a herd health programme in advance of housing so that we're maximising performance over this period. Um, ventilation, water, access to forage and plenty of it, good feed space um, and appropriate uh, stock and density in sheds as well. That's great, Ashley. I suppose really the first step for formulating a diet will come down to the silage quality. And if the silage quality is unknown, it's really hard to guess how much concentrates and what type of concentrates are needed to be fed. How can farmers go about getting a silage sample tested? Yeah, so they can link in with their local advisor. Silage samples are a really cost effective way of getting information uh, to decide what you need to do over the winter months. So you can either take samples if you have a pit already open uh, and a W shape across the face of that pit. Um, or take samples from uh, silage core to core an unopened pit or take samples from um, a, a random sample of bales if you have bale silage in the yard um, but it's really important information to have I suppose it gives you a starting point to work with then over uh, the winter months like you might be disappointed to find out your silage is only 65 TMD but it's a lot better to have that info now and use it to to implement a, a plan for the winter um, than maybe taking your weanlings out of the shed next spring and realising just they haven't pushed on at all and then there's knock-on consequences then in terms of next year, in terms of when they'll be finished or the saleability of that stock. So it gives you information to work with and then you can uh, look at the overall diet around that forage quality. So really what we're looking at uh, when you get your silage sample result back is the dry matter of that silage and the DMD, and the DMD is really the digestibility, so that really feeds into the overall quality. Uh, we're looking at the protein levels in that silage, so ideally we want that over 13% crude protein. We want it well preserved, Catherine, because there's no point having really good quality silage. If it's poorly preserved, that's going to affect intake, so we need good quality silage, but the silage that's going to promote high levels of intake as well, that cattle are going to really um, eat as much of it as they can to push on. Um, so 
looking at a pH between 3.8 and 4.5 and low ammonia levels less than 10%. So I suppose it's a combination of both that we don't just say, oh great, I've 75 DMD silage, but if it's really badly preserved, you're not going to have high intakes from that silage. So look at the whole picture as well. Um, so if you um, want to link in with your local tagus office, uh, your advisor will help you get, you can, they can either take the sample for you or get it sent off and go through that report with you when it comes back as well. That's great, Ashling. And you mentioned there, there is huge variation in silage samples, be it from 60 DMD up to 75 DMD. What impact can silage quality have on weanland performance over the winter period? Yeah, so it can have a huge impact really catching. It could be the difference between those uh, weanlands going into a shed and really doing no thrive at all. If we look at 60 DMD silage, um, weanlands really won't thrive in that silage and just have enough energy to actually maintain themselves uh, versus 75 DMD where they could potentially do 0.5 of a kilo um, right through the winter months. So really achieving that gain that we want to keep them doing over the winter months without any uh, meal feeding nearly. And so it's really important to have that information now and um, make decisions based on it rather than looking at wins next spring and being disappointed that they haven't maybe done what you expected them to do over the winter months. Um, So yeah, um, huge variation there. So really you need to find out what, quality silage you're feeding, look at the intake values around that and then determine your meal feeding on top of that because you could need to feed maybe two or three kilos of meal to your weanlands to keep them on track over the winter months. And when it comes to the different rations that's available, Ashling, what do farmers need to be looking for when they're looking at the label? Energy is the most important uh, factor um, and that's not always clearly labelled on a bag so it's important to have a relationship with your merchant and ask those questions um, but I suppose we can make informed decisions if we look at the quality of the ingredients on that bag. Uh, protein is another important uh, guide. So depending on the stock you're feeding, if you're looking at your finishing cattle, you're probably looking somewhere between 13 to 15% for a finisher ration. That'll depend on silage quality too. Um, you'll get away with a lower protein if you've really good quality silage because you typically get more protein out of that silage. Uh, similarly for a weanlands, you're looking at probably between 16 to 18% depending on silage quality too. Uh, 15 16 percent along good quality si- alongside good quality silage is perfect if you have very poor quality silage you might have to look at needing um slightly more protein from from your ration um so i suppose it's important to read the label carefully and look at the ingredients and if something isn't that clear or isn't that recognizable to you you have to question why it's in there like so you're trying to keep it as simple as possible um in terms of the ingredients you should be familiar what, with what's in it you should we all know that good quality ingredients are cereals, a uh, good quality source of protein like soya and maize distillers. Now, soya is quite expensive, um, so maize distillers and rapeseed might be um, in there as good quality sources of protein or beans. Um, but really, we should be looking for the the UFV value for finishing ration or the UFL for young stock um, as well. So ideally, a minimum UFL of 0.93, 0. 0.94, um, maybe slightly higher for a finishing ration if we, it can be got. Um, but I suppose minerals and molasses and everything else will feed into that. And when it comes to protein, what level of protein would you expect to see in those, those diets, be it for weanlands or store cattle or finishing rations? Yeah, so that will come back to the forage quality um, in terms of making that decision as well, Catherine. So if we know that our uh, we've got quality silage in the yard and it's quite high protein, like it might be between 14 and 15% then we can maybe get away with a slightly lower protein in our ration. So uh, for weanlands um, on really good quality silage, you could actually get away with a kilo of straight barley um, if your silage quality is good enough um, or else maybe 16, 17% crew protein ration or not for those animals. Um, and particularly as you go down through the silage quality, you want to be paying more attention to the protein level because you won't be getting the same level of protein from it. Um, or if you're using alternative sources of forage like maize or whole crop silages, that are lower in protein as well. Uh, but ideally, you're looking at 15% crew protein for the whole diet for weanlands and um, and growing cattle, so store cattle as well that have a bit of growing to do and then getting that back towards 11 or 12% for the finishing period. So um, 12 13% uh, protein ration for finishing cattle then. There's been numerous research studies actually carried out in relation to different diets and the content of different rations that you've mentioned there. What are the key research findings in relation to diet formulation? Well, it comes back to the level of feed that's going in. Um, 
So like we've seen on some of the work from Grange that soya hulls at a kilo um, can achieve the same level of performance as barley going into Wheelands. But if you look at it then from a finishing point of view where you're getting into higher feed rates, it's not uh, coming through to the same extent. So you're really looking at it being capped at maybe 20% of a finishing ration. Um, if we look at the likes of maize distillers, uh, 40% cap in a finishing ration, the likes of those. So like really you're looking at uh, coming back to your high quality products like your barleys, your maize distillers, the lower or your byproducts, you're probably looking at them at smaller inclusion rates. So um, but we want the higher quality ones of those. So the likes of your citrus pulp, your beet pulp, uh, your soya hulls, they have reasonably high UFL values. Whereas if you look at the likes of your palm kernel, sunflower, um, the likes of those are very, or wheat feed, wheat gluten. So lot, uh, the likes of those have lower UFL uh, and V values. So they're really going to dilute the energy density of your ration if they're going in there. Um, yeah, so it's about considering the individual ingredients, but also the, the volume of them going in there as well. That's great, interesting. And you mentioned it there, like farmers, we hear a lot of building up cattle on finishing diets and when should ad lib feeding be considered and what are the key management tips that are essential for ad lib finishing diets yeah so i suppose um it's really something to be considered when um particularly if silage quality is poor or in a year like this where maybe silage quality or supplies are tight on farm um it's a it's an option to be considered um, and particularly animals that have a high potential for growth because they will get the most uh, benefit from it um, adaption to that meal feeding is key so look you're looking at building that up over a three week period and gradually adapting cattle to the concentrate source um, and that by the time that they reach maybe 21 to 24 days at that point then you're back to kind of minimum inclusion of roughage at about 10% of their total intake um, it's very important that the meal supply doesn't run out once you get them up to that and that they have good access to uh, clean water uh, during that period um, I suppose something to also consider for those higher feeding levels or ad lib finishing is that um, if you're buying pre-formulated rations normally they contain between maybe two and two and a half percent minerals so ideally your cattle will get enough minerals be- from between five and six kilos of that meal so if you're looking at building cattle up to ad lib feeding that you're buying a ration that's suitable for feeding at those levels um, because you could have cattle eating up to 10, 12 kilos of meal. So we don't want them getting double the minerals um, that they should actually be getting because that's going to have knock-on impacts um, on the animal in terms of excreting those minerals and that and the cost as well. So it's important that if you're going down that route that you're getting a ration that's suitable for that that feeding scenario. And when it comes to the mineral inclusion rates that you mentioned there, Ashling. What are the key minerals that's important for it to be included in these rations? Yeah, so we want to get a nice balance of our trace elements. Um, but we're also looking at the macros, in particular the likes of phosphorus. Um, during the finishing period, that's really important for overall growth and performance. And particularly if you're using the likes of beet or maize during that period, that you're getting enough phosphorus in, in those scenarios to balance it. Um, but yeah, a good... Um, well-balanced mineral in terms of copper, zinc, um, selenium, iodine, um, they all have a huge role to play in terms of growth and performance and maintaining healthy animals um, during that period. And like in a finishing scenario, we're putting those animals under pressure. We're trying to get a high level of performance out of them. So they all have a role to play in contributing to that health. But like really a 600 kilo animal, you're looking at between maybe 120 to 140 grams of mineral max. So typically most of your pre-formulated rations will have maybe two to two and a half percent minerals included so really five six kilos will contribute a lot of what they need in terms of minerals um, once it's well balanced so it's important that if you're buying a ration that you have that discussion with the merchant about what's actually available within it. And speaking with farmers Ashling, concentrate prices are back this year what's good value at the moment? Our cereals um, are good value maize distillers as a protein source is probably better value than soya and it's it's quite a high UFL and uh, UFE product as well. I suppose if we look at the relative feeds table and uh, that's available on the Chagas website, that allows us to compare uh, ingredients based on a unit of energy and a unit of protein. So it allows us to compare what's good value at the moment compared to barley and maize distillers. Um, so at the moment, beans and bee pulp are probably more expensive. 
relatively speaking. And while they do contribute a lot in terms of the quality of them as ingredients and they can make a, a rasha look very well, it's important that they're not going in there and covering up maybe for because of the cost of them that there's lower uh, quality ingredients sneaking in in the background there as well. So um, it's important to look at the whole label uh, that you're not buying those lower uh, UFV ingredients that's diluting the overall energy of it. So the likes of your wheat feed, palm kernel, sunflower. Um, yeah, so we want really good ingredients across the label. So barley, maize, maize and sillers, rapeseed, beans, beet pulp, uh, soy hulls to a point, um, but that, that minimal inclusion that likes the, the hulls might dilute the overall energy density and that we really don't want to see any of those lower quality ingredients coming in. You're paying for your feed. You want to deliver a certain level of performance. We don't want poorer ingredients coming in there and diluting that. It's very important, actually, for farmers to be mindful of any fillers that's put into the ration. As you say, that was reflected very much so in the price. You've covered a lot there, actually, in the last number of minutes. For farmers that's considering cattle are being housed, they're thinking of what ration, they're going to get silage samples taken. What are the key two or three points that they need to be mindful of? It's a very tight margin business and I suppose a lot of the costs are attributable to that winter period, whether it's your whalings going in and trying to maintain a tribe over the next few months before they go back out or whether you're finishing cattle. But really focus on the basics, having a healthy animal, good quality forage or understanding what level of performance is achievable from the forage and feeding to meet the targets above that when it's required. So looking at high quality ingredients for going out and paying for concentrate ingredients that you're buying in good quality ration into the yard and know what you're working with in terms of the overall forage quality. There's a lot of work in terms of feeding out and labour with cattle in sheds so it's important that you're getting as much value out of that for the work that's involved and the costs involved over the next few months. That's great Ashling. thanks very much. Thanks Catherine. That's all for this week's episode and you can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.